Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Merle Oberon and George Brent in You Belong to Me. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. For the next hour, we invite you to lock up your troubles and throw away the key. Tonight's play contains no plan to remake the world. No deep analysis of modern society. But in these or any other times, we believe that good entertainment is its own excuse for being. So sit back and listen to Merle Oberon and George Brent as they bring us the gaiety and romance of the current Columbia picture success, You Belong to Me. It's the story of a doctor, a very glamorous doctor, played by Merle Oberon. George Brent is the wealthy and charming sportsman who marries the lovely medical but has rather a difficult time competing with such rivals as measles and broken clavicles. You Belong to Me is a fascinating comedy, bringing good cheer tonight to our regular audience from coast to coast, and also to the boys in the American Armed Forces all over the world who hear it too. Women doctors are no longer a rarity, even beautiful ones. As a matter of fact, Women have proved their ability at most of the jobs that keep the economic world going round, and in so doing, have given Lux Toilet Soap a lot of new jobs, too. Glamour used to be considered the exclusive property of the theater and certain upper reaches of the social ladder. We still ins insist on our theatrical stars being beautiful, but they certainly have no monop monopoly on that commodity. Some of the women who are doing vital jobs in their country these days, might very easily lay aside their welding torches and riveting hammers and step into a screen close-up. Lux Toilet Soap plays no favorites whatsoever. It's the servant of beauty in a mansion or beauty in an airplane factory. Now it's curtain time, and we present the first act of You Belong to Me, starring George Brent as Peter Kirk and Merle Oberon as Dr. Helen Hunt, with Bill Goodwin as Vandermeer. Down the snow-covered slopes of the high Sierras, a skier glides like a playful gull in flight. He's a master of his sport. In sheer exhilaration, the skier bellows his challenge to fate. <laughs> Suddenly, his ski hits a hidden boulder. He zooms through space like a giant pinwheel, bounces off a tree, and dives head foremost into a snowbank. One hour later, he regains consciousness. He opens his eyes to see bending over him a very lovely young woman. Oh, what happened? Take it easy. You'll be all right. Oh, sure. I'm fine. I've sent back to the hotel for a dog sled. Don't try to move. I remember now. I was coming down the hill. You were standing at the bottom all alone. You looked so pretty, and I, I tried to show off. That was an hour ago. Oh. You know, you aren't pretty. You're beautiful. Upside, up, whoop. Here's the sled coming. Just relax now. I'll hold your head. You will? Oh, thank you. Just put him over here, please. I'll check him over in a jiffy. Okay, Doc. Be careful. He may have some bones broken. Yes, be careful, fellow. That's it, right there. Now, everyone outside, please. I'll make an examination. Hope you're all right, Mr. Kirk. Yeah, yeah. Young lady, will you leave, please? I'd rather wait, if you don't mind. Are you a relative? No, I've never seen him before. Then perhaps I can handle this better alone. All right. I just thought I might help. I'm Dr. Hunt of Los Angeles. A doctor? You? Dr. Hunt? A specialist? General practice. Huh, I see. Frankly, you can be of no help. And now, if you'll be so kind as to leave me with my patient... Oh, wait a minute. Doesn't the patient have a right to select his own doctor? Naturally. Well, all right, then. Hello, doctor. Hello. I'm at your mercy. You're the boss, Dr. Hunt. Thank you. Just lie back, please. Dr. Hunt, Mr. Kirk is an important man. I intend to call in specialists. For what? Yes, for what? Dr. Hunt, the medical association shall hear about this. Well, what will you tell them? Have I picked another doctor in preference to you? 
You want the other one hung? We'll engage your services immediately, Doctor, for x-rays. What? Let me see. At the scene of the accident, I noted contusion and a small hematoma of the right posterior parietal region. The absence of bradycardia indicated very little concussion, but take a shot of his head to make sure. There may be a Potts fracture on the left side and a crack in the tibia and fibula higher up, so we'll take a shot of the whole leg. As soon as you're ready, Doctor. Very well. <laughs> we told him that time, didn't we? Doctor. Doctor. Doctor! What's the matter? Oh, hello. What did you yell like that for? Well, I, I wanted to know where you were. I've taken the adjoining room. I'll be there if you need me. It's two o'clock in the morning. Now do get some sleep. Oh, wait, wait. I, I don't feel well. You don't? Let me feel your pulse. Oh, yes, I think you're better. Well, is it still going? Quiet, please. Your pulse is very good. What seems to be the trouble? <laughs> well, I was lonesome. <laughs> I see. Mr. Kirk, this case has become very important to me because of the little argument I had with the hotel doctor. It's so important that I'll appreciate hearing about any new symptoms, except loneliness. Good night. Oh, you forgot something. What? You didn't take my temperature. Don't be silly. You have no fever. You want to bet? Why should I? Your temperature's normal. I'll bet you $50 against 15 minutes of your time that I have a fever. Is it a bet? All right, it's a bet. I suppose the doctor shouldn't complain about imaginary ailments. They account for more than half of a year's income. Open your mouth. Ah. Now, don't try to talk with a thermometer. The hotel doctor said you were important. How did he mean? Mm. -mm. Position? Mm -mm. Achievement? Mm -mm. Family? Mm -mm. Money? Mm -mm. <laughs> Why did you nod so reluctantly? <laughs> Are you worried about my bill? Mm -mm. Or do you have a feeling that having lots of money isn't being important? Mm -mm. Mm. I agree with you. <laughs> Let me have the thermometer, please. Well? Mm. It isn't much, but... 99.6. It's a fever. Yes, it is. Well, make yourself comfortable. I own the next 15 minutes. Well, doctor, I... Uh... Wait. Open your mouth again. What for? Open it. Say, ah. 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 Hmm. You seem pretty certain about that fever, didn't you? Anybody knows a thing like that. I'd say that throat's been sore for several days. What would you say? Maybe. You had a fever this morning, didn't you? Oh, it was nothing. Now, doctor, I... Open your mouth. Say, listen. Open. I own this 15 minutes. I want to talk. You can talk after I swab that throat. Ah. Oh, all right. <laughs> Fine. Yeah, it's lovely. If there's anything I enjoy, it's having a beautiful woman swab out my throat. Why were you skiing with a sore throat? What should I do? Why around waiting for her to get well? Certainly. By the way, Mr. Sure Thing Better, I have bad news for you. Your x-rays showed there are no fractures whatsoever. What's bad about that? Normally, you could be up and about by tomorrow. But now I'm going to keep you in bed until your throat is cleared. Well, that's a pleasure, as long as you're here with me. I happen to be on a vacation. I'll check with you at night, but that's all. Oh, no. You said my case meant a lot to you. It does. But anything I'm worried about would happen tonight. Oh, you don't know me. I'm liable to have a relapse three days from now. While you're out having the time of your life. Wouldn't that look great in the papers? Patient deceased while doctor skis. Mm. It's not even good poetry. Where are you going? To bed. I told you I came here for a rest. What about our bet? All right. The time is yours. Fine. Have you read any good books lately? <laughs> Tell me, are there many lady doctors? A few. As beautiful as you? No doubt. The time I've wasted being well. Can you imagine a hospital with nothing but women doctors all flitting from room to room, laying cool hands on your head? Oh, boy. <laughs> How old are you, Mr. Kirk? Why? The last male patient I had who talked like that was 73. Of course, his age was his alibi. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I was going to say finally that I think you're wonderful. I suppose that's rather monotonous too, isn't it? If I say yes, I'm conceited. But that's the answer. May I leave now, please? I'm very tired. Of course, I'm sorry. When will I see you again? Sometime tomorrow. It was selfish of me to keep you up. But thank you, and good night. Good night. Oh, uh, doctor. Yes? I still think you're wonderful. And I'm not 73. Good night. Oh, my doctor. Front boy, room 216. Oh, clerk, if my patient wants me, I'll be out in the skating rink. Yes, Dr. Hunt. Oh, uh, Miss Hunt. Yes? 
May I speak to you a moment? Uh, if you'll step over here, please. What is it? Miss Hunt, uh, I am Mr. Barrows, Peter Kirk's attorney. Oh, yes? Yes. I see now why my client has been acting so strangely these last three days. Strangely? Of course you know that Mr. Kirk is able to afford the finest medical care money can buy. I've heard insinuations to that effect. The resident doctor says you refuse to let him call in specialists. Mr. Kirk may do that any time he sees fit. And that isn't the point. I've checked your record and found that you've been in practice only three years. In general practice at that. I'm quite willing to turn the case over to any physician Mr. Kirk may name. He has already refused to see three of the finest specialists in Los Angeles. Why? He says he has a doctor. Then what am I supposed to do? My client is quite impressionable, Miss Hunt. Doctor. As I said, he's very impressionable. To put it plainly, Miss Hunt... Doctor. All right, doctor. To put it plainly, you appeal to him not as a doctor, but as a woman. Oh, and how did you decide that? Well, I have eyes, and I know my client. Dr. Hunt. As an ethical member of the medical profession, will you explain to Mr. Kirk that he needs more specialized attention than you are able to provide? No. Why not? Because Mr. Kirk's chief ailment right now is a sore throat. There are no broken bones, his head isn't cracked, and as long as he wants to be my patient, he'll be my patient. Furthermore, Mr. What's-Your-Name, you'd better stop worrying about your client and consider yourself, because you're an incipient alopecia if I ever saw one. What's that? You'll find out. Good day. Oh, hello, Doc. Why aren't you in bed, Mr. Kirk? Well, I was just... Throwing... Open your mouth. Huh? Open your mouth. Again? All I do is open and close my mouth. Ah. Ah. Why don't you take a photograph? Your throat is clearing nicely. You can help by having only liquids today and by gargling with salt water every hour or so. You probably still have a slight temperature, but that's to be expected. Say, what's the matter with you? Apparently, there aren't going to be any after effects from your fall, so if you feel well tomorrow, get up and do anything you darn well please. But if Mr. Barrows decides that your financial position necessitates calling in 18 specialists with long beards, let him call them in. Because I'm through with this case right now. Oh, so you talk to Barrows. That has nothing to do with it. You're well, and I, I have work to do back in town. I'm leaving right now. Well, won't you stay? I'll be glad to pay you for your full time. Mr. Kirk, that's exactly what I don't like about this case. Mr. Barrows announces that my ability is inferior to your bank book, and you seem to think that my services can be bought by someone who doesn't need them. I apologize. That was stupid of me. I, I guess I should apologize, too. But I definitely don't like your Mr. Barrows. Well, forget him. Will you stay? I have to go back, honestly. Goodbye. I'm glad I was able to help you. Oh, wait. Will I see you in Los Angeles? No. Why? I'll be very busy at the hospital. I could get run over. No. Goodbye, Mr. Kirk. Well, wait, wait, please. You, you can't just walk out on me like this. What do you expect me to do? Well, I, I mean, um, haven't you got anything to say except goodbye? All right. Goodbye, Mr. Kirk. And don't forget to gargle. Hello. Hello. Is this the desk? Listen, this is Peter Kirk. Dr. Hunt just left for Los Angeles in her car. Get her back. I've had a relapse. A relapse! Tell her it's something internal. What's the matter? Oh, doctor. What happened to you? Where's the house doctor? Why isn't he here? Huh? The house doctor, where is he? Oh, he's sick. Are you oh. in pain? Oh, terribly. Where? All over. Uh, first it's in my chest, and then it's in my head and my arms, and it, it sort of travels. Oh, I see. And just where is it now, Mr. Kirk? Now? Oh, I, I can't locate it uh, now. Mr. Kirk, do you realize what you've done? When I refuse to call in specialists on this case, I stake my whole reputation on your being well. Have you any idea the torture I went through when I received this, this fake call? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I never thought. What if you had suffered an internal hemorrhage? Where would I be? Where would I be? This isn't funny. I know. It's tragic. More than you know. What do you mean by that? Well, I brought you back here for a definite reason, and now I'm licked before I start. Start what? Well, uh, look, uh, ju just sit down and, and tell me something. Now, don't get excited or anything. Just tell me. Do you have a feeling that someday we'll be married? What? Now, no, easy now. I didn't say today or tomorrow, uh, uh, but someday. Of course not. There, you see? That's why I don't want you to leave so quickly. I thought you should know these things before you go back to town. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I knew at the moment I met you. Of course, I had the advantage because I'd been unconscious and had a fever. This is crazy. Absolutely crazy. You're not even proposing. You're telling me. Oh, I'll propose later, naturally. I... Uh, I, I just wanted you to understand things as I see them before you leave. 
Is that all? Yes, except that I think I love you very much, and I promise to be a faithful and considerate husband. May I leave now? If you wish. Thank you. Mr. Kirk, whatever type of woman you've known is your business. But I can assure you that this sort of talk doesn't appeal to me at all. Well, if I've done wrong, I apologize. You certainly have. You've made a childish attempt to... To sweep me off my feet with the most insincere line of emotionalism I've ever heard in my life. I told you I'm in love with you and I meant it. Might have worked if I were a young girl with, with a piece of wedding cake under my pillow, but I'm a woman. A woman with the coldly clinical mind of a doctor. Goodbye, Mr. Kirk. Peter Kirk marries Lady Doctor. Playboy weds female medical. She looked down my throat, says young millionaire. It was love at first sight. Last stop, out, my bride. Oh, Peter, I'm, I'm still terribly confused. Perhaps we shouldn't have come home so soon. <laughs> That's nice talk from a married woman. A married woman? Four hours. It'll take longer than that to get used to the idea. Well, come on, darling. I want you to see the house. Peter, is, is that it? That's it. You mean all this is yours? No, yours. But how can two people actually live in so many rooms? Is it too big? Well, I, I worked in a hospital that was smaller. Oh, don't you like it? Of course. But it might give me time to digest it. <laughs> All right. Now, up you go. We can't violate any old customs. Peter, you'll strain yourself. <laughs> I've got to carry my bride across the threshold, haven't I? Oh, Peter. Just you and me, darling. Our honeymoon. Darling. Ready? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. Congratulations, Mr. Kerr. Very much happiness to you. I hope you should be. Oh. Uh, oh. oh. <laughs> You'd better put me down, Peter. We are very happy, Mr. Kerr. Well, thank you, Moody. So am I. Uh, uh, Helen, dear, uh, this is the staff. Our butler, Moody. Welcome, Mrs. Kirk. Thank you, Moody. Ella, so happy Eva, Doris, Minnie, uh, Josephs, and Billings, the caretaker. Pleased to meet you, madam. Oh, the grounds look beautiful, Billings. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Kirk. We'll have dinner at eight, Ella, upstairs. Yes, sir, dinner And, at Joseph, eight, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kirk's uh, car is being driven here from the lodge this afternoon. Very good, sir. And now, Moody, if you'll get the things out of the car, I think... Immediately, sir. Oh, pardon, Mrs. Kirk, your, your office call. Thank you, Moody. And a Mr. Vandermeer. Vandermeer, oh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Say... How did they get our number? I wired my office. How about Mr. Vandermeer? He got the number from the office, probably. Peter, I'd like to see the rest of the house. Oh, uh, sure, but say, this man who called, who is he? Van? Yes, Mr. Vandermeer. One of my patients. Well, is, is he 73, too? No, a few years older than you. Oh, I didn't know you had any younger men patients. I had you, didn't I? Oh, darling, this is wonderful. You really like it? I love it. But for the first few days, I'd better travel around with a map. Oh, <laughs> some of the rooms are closed. Maybe we can turn one of them into a study. We already have two studies. What about moving your office here? Oh, no. My work stays out of the home. The laboratory, then. Don't you do things with test tubes and... Not around the house. Oh, Peter, it's so wonderful. Peter, promise me one thing. Anything? Never let me do what I've dreamed about. Never let me sleep till noon and have breakfast in bed. Make me get up early and brush my teeth and shower and dress and sit down at a table like a good, honest human being. Promise? Promise. Oh, darling. Is the dinner ready to be served? Yes. I'm just getting ready to take it up to them. I will take it up, Ella. Oh, Mr. Moody. Please. Let me have the tray. Oh, isn't it romantic, though? Dinner upstairs. Joseph says they have the phonograph on and they're playing nothing but love songs. <laughs> I'm so excited I can't breathe. The tray, please. Oh, here, but I wish you'd let me take it, Mr. Moody. Oh, dear. Moody. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Mr. Kirk. Uh, I-, I was just about to bring the tray up, sir. Never mind the tray. Joseph, get the car out. The car, sir? Mrs. Kirk has just received an emergency call. She's leaving immediately. Leaving? Now? Tonight, sir? Tonight. Oh. Oh, well, what are you crying about? Well, the car's waiting. Oh, Peter, this is terrible, I know. But Mrs. Roberts is an old woman, dear, and she's very ill. I have to go to her. I know, sure. But I still feel like a bride left the wedding at the church. Listen, dear, before we were married, you said you understood thoroughly that I was to continue my practice. That's true, isn't it? How could any man understand it this thoroughly? But it's true, isn't it? Yes, but I sort of hoped you'd change your mind. I know I didn't expect to spend my wedding night playing solitaire. It's my wedding night, too. But a doctor can't ignore an emergency call. And no matter how much we dislike the idea, I have to leave. 
I'd like to hear you wish me luck, Peter. You know I do. And hurry back, dear. Kiss me? Sure. Good night, darling. Good night. <sighs> Mr. Kirk, sir. Yes, Moody? Shall I, uh, shall I lock up for the night, sir? Yeah, lock up. It's, it's too bad, sir. Hmm. Ella is quite broken up. Poor Ella. <laughs> well, sir, people will get sick, and a doctor's first duty is to his patient. Never mind the philosophy, Moody. Get me the papers and a glass of hot milk. Very good, sir. <sighs> Peter! Oh, darling, you've come back. I knew you would. I knew you couldn't leave. Not without my stethoscope. Here it is. Good night, dear. Oh. In just a few moments, Mr. DeMille and our stars Merle O'Baron and George Brent will bring us Act Two of You Belong to Me. Now, for a moment, a little domestic scene that could happen anywhere. Well, look at my little wife. Must be a special occasion, eh? Hello, dear. What makes you think it's a special occasion? I'm not dressed up, really. Just these bows in my hair. Yeah, I see now that's not a new dress, but you look awful good somehow. Oh, Bobby, you're a darling. You never let me down. As a matter of fact, tonight is a sort of special occasion. Know why? Can't even make a guess. Well, you see, I've been making an experiment. A 30-day beauty experiment. Active lather facials with Lux soap every single day without fail. And this, my nice observing husband, is the 30th day. Well, from where I sit, I'd say the whole thing had been a big success. Come here a moment. <laughs> what is it, dear? Want to look closer? Look nothing. I want a kiss. Famous Hollywood screen stars, lovely women everywhere, say of Lux Toilet Soap, it's a wonderful beauty aid. This luxurious white soap has creamy, active lather that removes stale cosmetics, every trace of dust and dirt. You'll love the gentle way it caresses the skin, gives it protection it needs to look smooth, soft, lovely. Here's what Loretta Young says. I never neglect my daily active lather facial with Lux Soap. Here's what I do. First, I pat the creamy lather lightly in. Rinse with warm water, then a dash of cool. Then with a towel, I pat my face gently to dry. That sounds simple, doesn't it? If your skin isn't as lovely as it might be, why not start tomorrow on a 30-day trial of this gentle, effective, active lather care? Get some Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of You Belong to Me. Starring George Brent as Peter Kirk and Merle Oberon as Dr. Helen Hunt, with Bill Goodwin as Vandermeer. The wedding night is over. At 6.30 the following morning, Peter Kirk is awakened by a movement in the next room. Stumbling from his bed, he flings open the connecting door and finds his wife having breakfast. Breakfast for one. Well, good morning, darling. Hello. When did you get back? A couple of hours ago. A couple of hours? Why didn't you wake me up? Darling, it was 4.30. Besides, you look so peaceful. And you have the funniest snore. Oh, I didn't realize that I snored. Well, now, don't be touchy, darling. It can happen to anyone. It's just a little vibration of the soft palate. I must be revolting. Oh, not at all. <laughs> Makes me feel like an experienced old wife. Say, what is this? Breakfast for one. Yes, what's wrong? Well, who brought it up? Moody? Yes, dear, why? Breakfast for one in the morning after our wedding night? What do you think the servants are saying? Deserted on his wedding night, ignore the next morning? Don't you think I have any pride? Oh, Peter, stop worrying about what the servants are saying. Just because I have to be up at an unearthly hour this morning is no reason why your pride should be hurt. I thought I was doing you a favor. Mm, forgive me, darling. After all, I could have awakened when you did. You didn't drug me. Do you forgive me? <laughs> of course. But tomorrow when I get up, I'll shake you till your teeth rattle. Say, what did you get up so early for anyway? I have an appendectomy at the hospital. Today? Mm-hmm. Why? What's today? Well, it's the first day after our marriage. You mean you're going right back to work as though I didn't even exist? Oh, don't say that. My patients need me, Peter. Well, didn't it occur to you that your husband might like you around, too? Of course, darling, and I'd give anything to stay. But don't forget I've just come back from a vacation. All right. I give up. Is she in a bad way? Who? The lady with the appendix. 
Oh, it isn't a lady. It isn't? Mm -hmm. His name is John Bellows. Well, well, don't you have any lady patients? Quite a few. Also Mr. Bellows. He'll be six in November. Oh. Oh, oh well. <laughs> Darling, I'm sorry. Really, I am. Uh... Am I supposed to forgive you again? Please. I shouldn't, but you know I will, don't you? How about dinner out tonight? To celebrate the anniversary of our second day. I'd love it. Tony's, the one on Alvera Street. What time will you be home? Around seven. Then we can leave at eight. All right, darling. Goodbye. Uh, got time for a kiss? A very short one. Oh, darling, that kiss was sabotage. I've lost interest in my work. We'll try another. No. Coward. <laughs> Sorry, dear. My first duty is to Johnny's appendix. Goodbye. Till tonight. <laughs> Good morning, Lakewood Country Club. Mr. Kirk, I believe he's out on the golf course, but I can give him a message when he returns. Very well, sir. Hey, fellas, the bridegroom's coming off the course. Let's give him the works. Lay off, Lop. Your wit's about as subtle as a snowplow. Hey, Kirk, how do you like married life? Uh, how do you like Hi, you fellas. Congratulations, Pete. Well, thanks, Gulliver. And pay no attention to the ribs. Hey, where's the bride, Kirk? On her honeymoon? <laughs> no, she's working. Oh. Working with all your dough? Oh, that's right. She's a sawbones, isn't she? A doctor, yes. <laughs> I knew a lady barber once. Very funny, very funny. Say, how does it feel being married to a doctor? Oh, fine. Say, uh, when a lady doctor marries, does she change her name or yours? Oh, cut it out. <laughs> well, from the looks of the bride's picture in the papers, Peter, I'd say watch out for sick wool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel so well myself. Say, uh... Do you take appointments for the bride? That's enough, Lop. It was enough before they started. Come on, guys, break it up. Oh, Say, wait a minute. Dr. Helen Hunt, of course, sure. What about her? Well, Jim Vandermeer. What? Yeah, Jim Vandermeer. Well, he's been raving about Dr. Hunt for months. Well, I, I'm complimented. Well, you know him, don't you? He's a member here. No, I don't. Sure, that tall, good-looking guy? He's the best-looking fellow in the club. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Strictly a lady's delight. <laughs> ah, that's him. He's been leaving here early every afternoon. For a treatment. <laughs> oh, oh what's, what's wrong with him? I don't know. I do. What? Nothing. All right, Lop, stand up. Huh? Uh, why? Stand up. Uh, what for? I... I don't like you, Lop. Uh, hey. Oh! Come on, darling. I don't see how you can take so long hooking up a few little hooks. Well, it's uh, there so little. We'll be awfully late for dinner. What did you do today? Oh, nothing much. Played a little golf. Is that what you do every day? Well, it keeps you in condition. Oh, sure. Mm hmm How was business? Business? Oh, as usual. Many uh, customers? <laughs> you mean patients. About the same. Somebody mentioned one of your uh, men patients today. Who? Jim Vandermeer. Oh, Van. Yes, we talked about him yesterday, remember? I've been treating him for some time. Is he what you'd call uh, nice-looking? I don't know. Why? Well, don't you know him very well? Peter, what did you hear? Oh, nothing. You've heard something, obviously. I'd better set you straight. Before I met you, Van asked me to marry him. I said no. That's that, and that's all. Oh, it went that far. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, what's wrong with him? I mean, what are you treating him for? A fractured scapula. Oh, well, how did it happen? He was skiing. Huh? Skiing. Oh, don't tell me he fell practically at your feet. He did. Hmm. I thought I was being original. He had a multiple fracture of the scapula, which requires several months of heat treatments. That's the only reason I still see him. I'm sorry. Do you know what's wrong with me? Yes, I certainly do. You're jealous. Yes. You're jealous of the man I refused to marry, and you're the man I married. It's silly, I know. Anyway, I feel better now. <laughs> then so do I. Let's go to dinner. Oh, uh, just one more question. Far away. Uh, where is that place he's hurt, the, uh, the scapula? The shoulder blade. Oh, fine. <laughs> Quite a surprise to find that your husband dances well. <laughs> it's the inspiration. I surprised <laughs> myself. <laughs> Sit down, dear. Oh, you know, this is just about the time the phone rang last night. Oh, well, no one knows where you are tonight, do they? No one. Oh, good. A toast to all the men who could have invented the telephone but didn't. Helen. Oh, oh, hello. Well, how are you? Did you get my wire? Well, I'd, I'd like to repeat my congratulations in person. 
Congratulations, Helen. Why, thanks. This is my husband, Peter Kirk, Mr. Vandermeer. What? Well, uh, how do you do? How are you, Kirk? I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'd, I'd say that's for the doctor to decide, huh? <laughs> well, honestly, Helen, this news was the surprise of my life. Really, I had no idea, positively no idea. Well, it was rather sudden. Sudden? I had tickets for the theater for the night you were to return... And that morning when I picked up the paper and saw you looking down the groom's throat. <laughs> uh, have you known him long? Long? Oh, long enough. <laughs> There's one for the book, Kirk. I, I asked your bride if she'd known you long, and she said, long enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I didn't mean it that way at all. Oh, of course, Helen, I, I know you didn't. Can't a poor old bachelor have his joke? I, I'm resigned to the inevitable, Helen. Just a purely um, professional appointment now and then for bare consolation. May I congratulate you again, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, of course. Well, goodbye, Kirk. <laughs> Lucky dog. Thanks. Oh, wait. Uh, no offense, Kirk. Um, a kiss for the bride. Oh, Van, I don't. Please. Hey, that's enough. Now get out of here. What? Go on. Oh, Peter, what's the matter? Let me go, or I'll smash every scapula in his body. <laughs> If you'd care to come outside, I'll give you my version of that. You're talking. Now you're talking. Come on. No, no, no. Please, please, Peter, sit down. Van. Van, I'll have to ask you to accept our apologies. Well, if you wish. And I'll see you tomorrow, Van, at two. Okay. Well, good night. Helen. Please take me home. I, uh, I suppose there's nothing I can say. Absolutely nothing. Good night, Peter. Good night? Well, what do you mean? Why are you going in the guest room? I'm sleeping there tonight. Oh. May I say something? May I say it for you? You've acted like a child. We've been married two days, and you've violated every rule in existence as to how to treat a wife. But listen, it was Vandermeer I was going to sock, not you. What are you trying to do? Insult my patients so I'll be driven out of practice? Well, darling, tonight you saw me as I am. Jealous, short-tempered, and acting like a fool. I've never been this way before. And the only explanation is that I love you so much, I don't know what I'm doing. How long it's going to last, I have no idea. Maybe if marriage becomes a matter of fact with me, I'll return to normal. But I honestly hope not. I want to feel this way about you forever. Will you be patient and forgive me? Oh, but Peter, this can't go on, this, this suspicion. I'll do everything in my power to make you forget how I've acted. I don't know. Please. Well, let me think. I can't think with you here. Go outside a minute and close the door. Anything you say. Peter? Yes? I've thought it over. Well? I can't think anyway, so come in, Peter, and close the door. Breakfast is served, Mrs. Kirk. Thank you. Good morning, Moody. Good morning, madam. Good morning, Moody. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'll serve, Moody. Yes, sir. <laughs> Coffee, darling? Please. Oh, I've got a busy day ahead of me. Uh, well, will you be home for dinner? I hope so. Uh, so do I. You, uh, uh, you uh, have Mr. Vandermeer, too. Yes, I know. Yes, yes, I, I just mentioned it in case you'd forgotten. Thank you, Peter. Uh -huh. I uh, hope he's all right. I hope so. Uh -huh. Will you convey my apologies again? If you wish. Uh, dum de dum two o'clock. What? Did I say something? You said... Dum de dum, two o'clock. Oh, did I? Well, uh, I must have been thinking of something. Peter, you're acting very strangely this morning. I shouldn't be. I'm the happiest man in the world. Your mind's miles away. My mind's on you. That's why I'm happy. Oh, Peter, it's much nicer this way, isn't it? No silly jealousies cropping up. I love you. Darling. At any hour you can name, I'll be thinking of you. Ten o'clock, twelve o'clock, two... <laughs> Remember, remember that in your office. Here at home, there's a husband who's thinking of you every hour of the day. Twelve o'clock, one, uh, uh, two. <laughs> Darling, you're worrying about nothing. Oh, me, me worrying? <laughs> Listen, I'll be thinking about you at twelve and one and two. Darling. <laughs>
Hello? Uh, Mr. Vandermeer's secretary, please. Oh, hello. Uh, this is Mr. Uh, Jones. Harold Jones. Now, uh, I'm interested in purchasing some property Mr. Vandermeer owns. And uh, may I see him this afternoon at uh, two? <laughs> oh. Well, two is the only time I have open. He has? With his doctor, huh? I see. Well, he, uh, he couldn't cancel that appointment. Uh-huh. All right. Goodbye. Twelve o'clock. One o'clock. Two. Hello? Anybody at home? Helen. Hello, darling. Well, you made it for dinner. I told you I'd try. Hey, listen, look at me. Do I look different? No. Well, I am. Helen, I've won a battle. What battle? With myself. I'll be honest, honey. When you left here this morning, I was raging inside with jealousy, imagining all sorts of crazy things about you and Vandermeer. Why, for a while, I even considered going to your office and throwing Vandermeer out bodily. But I fought this battle with myself, and I won. You're not jealous anymore? You won't imagine things? Never. I've changed completely. Well, I'm certainly glad to hear that, because I didn't see Vandermeer this afternoon. Huh? You didn't see him? No. I'm going to his house tonight. Tonight? He's ill, too ill to leave his house. I was supposed to go there straight from the office, but I wanted to see you, even if it was only for a few minutes. But Vandermeer's house at night. Well, is this the change, Mr. Kirk, talking? Oh, I'm sorry. Is it that scapula again? No, flu. Flu? Well, he was at his office today. Was he? How do you know? I, uh, well, so somebody told me. He left there at noon. Now listen, dear. You fought a battle and you've won it. That's fine, and I'm proud of you. Make me stay proud of you. All right. Are you leaving right now? Right now, darling. I'll be back in an hour. I'll walk to the car with you. Don't bother, dear. If you like, I'll drive you to Vandermeer's. No, thanks. You'd better wait here. But look, look, the moon's out. Why, I feel like a kid in high school. <laughs> Peter, you're happy, honestly? No, I've never been happier. I want so much for this marriage to be a success. Above all else, it must be. It will be, darling. I'll hurry back. Take your time, dear. <laughs> I won't worry. Goodbye. Bye. <sighs> Is she gone, sir? Again? Yes, an emergency call. Dear dummy, and dinner, sir? Well, Mrs. Kirk will be back by eight. She's only gone to Mr. Vandermeer's. Mr. Vandermeer, sir? Yes. Why do you say it that way? Well, uh, it, it was the surprise, sir. I saw Mr. Vandermeer's cook at the market today, and she said Mr. Vandermeer was in excellent health. She, she did? Yes, sir, uh... Was it an accident? No, probably the flu. They, uh, why, they say it hit you like a thunderbolt. Ah, yes, sir. Sure, why, you, 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 you never can tell about the flu. Well, I mean, one minute you're fine, and, and then the next... Moody! Yes, sir? Tell Joseph to get my car, quick! Nurse, make that one teaspoonful in a glass of water. Yes, doctor, right away. Oh, how am I? Van, you're about as original as a piece of carbon paper. Along with some 30,000 others, you have a plain old case of flu. Feel like a dish rag. Naturally. How's your back? Oh, all right. If it hurts, it's the flu, not your scapula. I saw your x-rays and you're all right. Mm -hmm. Doctor, Dr. Hunt. Well, nurse, where's the medicine? Doctor, there's a man climbing the ivy outside the window. What? A man. I saw him from the bathroom. He's looking in this window now. Well, don't look. Nurse, call the police. Yes, sir. No, wait. If he sees a guard now, he'll get suspicious and leave. Just go about things normally, and maybe I'll be able to get a look at him. Mm, good idea. We can give a complete description to the police. Sit down, nurse. Yes, sir. I, I'll work around to the side of the bed here, then I'll take a quick jump and open the window. Well, be careful now. Don't worry. He's there. I saw something. Don't look. Are you sure it wasn't the cat? A cat with a hat and coat? It was a man. All right. Here I go. Oh! 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 Oh, oh. oh. hello, Helen. <laughs> Helen, may I come in? Helen! Well? May I come in? Can you offer any sane explanation of your conduct tonight? No. Can you give me any logical reason why I should continue to tolerate your insane jealousies? No. From the day we were married, you've been unhappy. You've questioned my every move. You've been suspicious of my work and my character. And now, finally, you turn into a peeping Tom. Well, I didn't mean it that way. It's not that I don't trust you. I don't trust Vandermeer. 
So you doubt if I have enough decency to remain a loyal wife. Is that why you played peekaboo in the ivy? Oh, that isn't it. Peter Kirk, you're the most tragic case I've ever met. Just because money has been dumped into your lap, you choose to be completely without purpose or ambition. Was having money a crime? No, not when you can point to something you can be proud of. You haven't a single useful activity. So to occupy your idle talents, you set about destroying our happiness. But darling, the only trouble is you're away so much. There's no need for you to work. We've discussed that. You knew I was going to continue my practice. Well, I thought maybe that... Maybe what? That I'd throw, throw aside something I can do that's worthwhile and become as, as idle and purposeless as you? No, thanks, Peter. I have to have a reason for being on Earth. Oh, is that the way you feel about me? Well, it's nice to know. Much as I love you, Peter, we can't go on like this. But I'm in no mood to make a calm decision tonight. For the sake of both of us, we'd better leave that till the morning. Good night. Oh, wait, Helen, listen. No. Helen, open the door. Helen! I said good night and I meant it. Oh, all right. Good night. <laughs> Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Merle Oberon and George Brent in Act Three of You Belong to Me. Once upon a time, a young man sent a young lady a box of flowers. They were roses, long-stemmed and fragrant. And when the young lady said, Johnny, what gorgeous flowers! The young man said, Flowers always remind me of you. I wish I could send you roses every day. You're so sweet. And that little story expresses the way many a man feels about the girl who's won his heart. She needn't be beautiful to make him think she's the loveliest girl he knows. But one charm she must have. The charm of flower freshness. Of exquisite daintiness. It's such a feminine charm. And always it's a winner. Screen stars know this. They say, when you're sure of daintiness, you're sure of charm. And here's the simple way famous Hollywood stars make sure. They use their complexion soap, smooth white luxe toilet soap, as a daily bath soap, too. Lovely Joan Bennett says, Lux soap's active lather is so gentle, so thorough, leaves skin really fresh and sweet. Try this luxurious bath as a quick beauty pickup. Let the generous, creamy Lux soap lather carry away every trace of the day's dust and dirt. When you step out of a Lux toilet soap bath, your skin feels satin smooth. It's fresh and sweet. Perfumed, too, with a delicate flower-like fragrance. And you'll find Lux toilet soap economical because it's hard milled, can be used to the last thin sliver. Why not get three cakes of this fine, fragrant white soap tomorrow? Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of You Belong to Me. Starring George Brent and Merle Oberon. Peter Kirk is out to better himself. Spurned by his wife as a do-nothing, he is determined to do something. In Hill's department store, the young millionaire applies for a job as a clerk. Salary, $22.50 per week. All right, who's the next applicant? I guess I am. Good morning. I'm a sales clerk. Neckties, gloves, hats, and sportswear. Five years' experience in New York. And if you have nothing in those departments, I know department store routine from top to bottom. Why'd you leave your last job? Uh, to uh, visit my sick uncle in California. Job pays twenty-two fifty. That isn't important at the start. I'll prove my value later. Name? John Jenkins. All right, Jenkins, go in and prove your value. Thank you, sir. You'll never regret this. Hey, wait. Yes, sir? Didn't I see your picture in the paper lately? Me? Oh, no, no. It was some millionaire looked like you. 
That fellow that married a lady doctor. Yes, right. He did look something like me. Yeah, all but his bank book, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Emma. Oh, good morning, Dr. Hunt. Any calls? Yes, Mr. Kirk. Mr. Kirk, when? Just a minute ago. Did he, did he leave any message? Well, he didn't have time to talk. He said he was busy. Where is he? That's all I want to know. He's at Hill's department store, counter seven, main floor. And if you can't find him, ask for Mr. Jenkins. What does that mean? I don't know, doctor. He's your husband. Good afternoon, madame. And what can I do for you? Peter. Hello. I asked to see Mr. Jenkins, and they said they that... said he was here at the tie counter. Madam, have you considered the matter of your husband's Christmas present? Remember, there are only 246 more shopping days. Now, it is not my intention to rush you, but... Peter, I... you're working. Sure. 2250 a week. Oh, oh, Mr. Jenkins, you're wonderful. Oh, what's so funny? I mean it. It wouldn't matter if you were digging ditches or selling potato peelers. To see you actually working and making yourself useful is the greatest thrill I've ever had. Darling, you were right last night. This is all I needed to get me out of that rut of doing nothing and waiting for, for the worst to happen. I like the feeling work gives you, that you're important enough to be paid for doing something. You know, it makes you want to do more, to better yourself, and I will, too. It's, it's quite a feeling. Darling. Yes, dear? Young man, are these the 59 cent ties you advertise? Oh, uh, yes, madam. Well, they're terrible. Well, uh, not to everyone, madam. Perhaps to a woman with exceptional taste like you. Well, uh, I know my colors. Now, here's another type. Do you notice the quality of those red stripes? Not blaring out as individual bars, but blending softly and easily with the blue. Yes. Well, this tie sells for five dollars. Five dollars? Yeah, in New York and Chicago, but not here. Oh. Uh, during our sale, you may have this for four thirty-nine, yes. an imported tie which we absolutely cannot replace in stock. Well, uh, could you wrap it as a gift? Certainly, madam. Just step to the end of the counter. Thank you. And thank you. Oh, Miss Bertel, cash please and wrap as a gift. Mr. Jenkins, is the tie salesman are absolutely unbeatable? How about as a husband? Have you made up your mind yet? I have. Well. Peter, everything that's happened before is a bad dream. Today is a new start, and it's perfect. This job may be small, but it's only the beginning. Why, with your talent, you'll be running the store in a year. You mean everything is all right? Don't you understand? I love you so much, and I'm so proud of you. There isn't anything in the world that could make me happier. Darling, kiss me. Mm, Peter. Young man. Uh, oh, uh, yes? Oh, dear. G uh, goodbye, darling. See you tonight. Bye. I'll have another tie just like this, please, young man. Certainly, madam. And young man? Yes, madam? You've got lipstick. Oh. Any more appointments, Emma? All through, doctor. Good. I'm going home. Emma, for three years you've been wanting to visit your folks back east. Well, go ahead. Because <coughs> I'm giving you your notice right now. I'm fired? With a month's extra pay and the best recommendation anyone ever had. You won't have any trouble. Dr. Smith wants you. But what goes on? Emma... Today I found out what it really means to be in love with your husband. To see him working at a good, plain job and doing everything he can to make you proud of him. It's a thrill, Emma. The greatest thrill in the world. You mean Mr. Kirk is working? With his money? He's the best necktie salesman in Los Angeles. And he'll be running Hill's department store in a year. But he could buy this store today. Emma, you have no soul. But you can go and visit your folks anyway. Because as of today, well... I'm retiring from practice and devoting myself to becoming a good, solid housewife. Well, I'll be darned. What do you think? I think you're crazy. And I'm tickled pink. Thanks. You know, Emma, I had the wrong slant on marriage, asking everything and sacrificing nothing. I'll miss my work, naturally. But my husband has more than made up for it. And I'm glad. Now you're talking. We're getting rid of everything I own here. Give Dr. Smith a br break on the patients. Who could use the books? Well, why not the county medical library? Good. And call the county hospital and turn over all my equipment to any deserving young doctor they name. A great start for a fine young man in a wonderful profession. Gosh, I feel good. You even sound good. Good night, Emma. I've got a date with my husband. Good night. Uh, there she is. Good evening, Dr. Hunt. Hello. Uh, how about a statement, Doctor? Yeah, how about a doctor? What about? Uh, as if you didn't know. Who are you? What is this all about? We, lady, are the press. Yeah, and we want something from you on the Kirk case. Kirk? Your husband, Doctor, remember? What's happened to him? Don't you read the papers, Doctor? Please, tell me. Here, here, look at the early edition. Thank yeah. you. 
No job for millionaire. Peter Kirk ousted as 2250 tire clerk when identity discovered. Fellow employees protest Playboy's job. The idea is they fired him because he was keeping some poor man out of work. Yeah, sure. This is insane. Oh, we want your opinion, Doc. Should he be permitted to work or not? Of course he should. Any man has the right, no matter how much money he has. Okay, Doc. Oh, You're the first one that's been yeah. for him. <laughs> Moody. Moody, is Mr. Kirk at home? He was, Mrs. Kirk, but he's gone again. Gone? Where? I don't know, ma'am. He was upset about getting a job and being fired. I know, but why did he leave? Excuse me, ma'am, but I think he didn't want to see you. He left a message. What did he say? It was something about not to lose faith in him. He'd make good somehow, and he won't come back till he does. Oh, Peter. Moody, call the newspapers. Get me the classified ads. The personal column. Peter, where are you? Signed, Helen. Peter, come home at once. Helen. Peter, if I don't hear from you, I'll call the police. Come home at once. Hello? Hello? Yes, she's here, I said. Hold on, please. Mrs. Kirk, it's for you. Give it to me, Moody. Hello? Yes, this is Dr. Hunt. My husband is where? Who's this? Central Hospital. I'll be right over. Wait. Wait, what's the matter with him? Hello? Hello? Will you please hurry, nurse? What room is my husband in? Right over here, Mrs. Kirk. Is he bad? What's the matter? What happened? Go in, please. Peter! Are you, Helen? Come in, come in. Oh, Peter, what? I thought you were hurt or sick. Me? Oh, I'm fine. So you were faking again. Isn't it enough that you left me without a word of explanation, that I haven't heard anything from you in four days? Why do you add to the torture by pretending to be on your deathbed? I pretended nothing. My secretary called to have you meet me here. Now sit down. What if you were fired from your job? We're man and wife. We could have worked things out together. That's what we're going to do. What do you think of this hospital? What in the world has it got to do with us? Plenty. We're buying it. Buying it? As a matter of fact, it's already bought. It's a good hospital, isn't it? Of course it is, but it's bankrupt. It's on the verge of shutting down right now. That's why I bought it. After purchase of the hospital, my yearly income will be $573,000. Last year, the hospital lost $400,000. This year, it should lose $550,000. That still is enough money for charity work and enough for us to live on. Will I be busy? You mean you're going to run it? Only the business and uh, management details. I won't interfere with your work. My work? As chief of staff. Lady, will you be busy? Am I hearing right? Are you throwing every penny of your income into this hospital knowing that you'll get nothing for it? What do you mean, nothing? I'll be helping in the sick. I'll be providing work for nurses, doctors, interns, and others I don't even know about. Well, every time I think about it, I get so darn choked up, I, I can hardly breathe. You should see the people in here, the kids especially with paralysis, broken bones, pneumonia. And we'll make them well or we'll die trying. Peter, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. And the most wonderful. And what I can't figure out is how for all these years I've managed to do nothing without cutting my throat. And the time I've wasted worrying what you were doing when I could have been helping you. Come on, I'll show you around. There's a kid in 219 I'm going to adopt if we get too busy. Oh, Peter, that lawyer who handles your financial affairs, what does he to say to all this? Oh, he's shooting himself tomorrow. You belong to me belongs to our pleasant memories now. But Merle Oberon and George Brent are coming back for a curtain call. Dr. Oberon, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Doctor. I'm delighted to be here again. If a nurse walked by now, I'd be sure this was a hospital. Uh, what kind of a doctor are you, C.B.? A veterinarian? <laughs> George, you should read the papers. The University of Southern California conferred an honorary doctor's degree on him at the annual commencement. Doctor of Fine Arts. Well, congratulations, C.B. That's a very great honor. Yes, it was quite a thrill, George. And it was a thrill just to see the commencement at the University of Southern California this year. Because for almost all the men graduates, it was an immediate prelude 
to entry into some branch of the armed service. And that's true at every college and university in the country. Well, the current rapid expansion in the armed forces must be presenting a tremendous challenge to an organization like the USO. The USO has done a great job all along, George. But now it has an international job. And to do it right, they need $32 million. Exactly what will the money be used for, CB? To take homesickness out of the Army and Navy and make Uncle Sam Jr. feel at home. That's why Sam Jr., when he goes to town on leave, can visit 900 recreational clubs in this country or 40 overseas. During the next year, while he's in camp, he may see any one of 6,000 shows put on by the USO. And if you've ever seen a lonesome soldier's face break into a grin, you know how important those shows are for Uncle Sam Jr. Well, if 130 million people get behind the USO, that $32 million should come easily. I suppose the best place to make a contribution to is the local USO headquarters. Yes, the, U the USO headquarters where you live. But if you can't find it, send your contribution to the USO at the Empire State Building, New York City. We'll give that address again later. And don't wait for someone to ask you to give. The USO needs money, and Uncle Sam Jr. needs the USO right now. What about next week's play, C.B.? I can tell you something about it, George, what makes it possible. It's a product called Lux Soap, of which you may have heard. Yes, I think I've heard it mentioned <laughs> in whispers around here. <laughs> I use it all the time myself. And because so many women have discovered that Lux Soap is a fine complexion care, well, you see, it's possible to have a Lux Radio Theater. Mm. Like Lux Soap, Merle, that's very sound economics. And next week, the Lux Radio Theater presents a romantic comedy that's been playing a merry tune in theaters all over the country. The Columbia Picture, Bedtime Story. And our stars will be Loretta Young and Donna Michi. You'll hear Loretta as a famous actress and Don as her husband, an equally famous playwright. Together, they've produced a long string of Broadway hits, but the most exciting of all is the story of their own life. So next Monday night, listen, my children, and you shall hear Bedtime Story. Starring Donna Michi and Loretta Young. That's great news, C.B. It should be a fine show. And I'll tell you some other good news. The Lux Radio Theater has entertained a hero in its audience tonight. The Navy doctor who won a radio tribute from President Roosevelt for bringing nine wounded soldiers through the Japanese attacking forces at Java is right out in front now. Lieutenant Commander Cardin Wassell. <laughs> and tomorrow, we start work on a picture that tells his heroic story. He's just arrived from Australia, and as though fate hadn't already thrown enough dangers in his path, he was flying across the Pacific while the Battle of Midway was in progress. We are all highly honored to have him here. Good night, C.B. Good night, C.B. Good night. Good night. And don't forget, give some dough to the UFO. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night. When the Lux Radio Theater presents Loretta Young and Donna Michi in Bedtime Story. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. All contributions to the USO should be made at your local headquarters or to the USO Empire State Building, New York City. The drive for the USO is limited to the United States and does not apply to Canada. Merle Oberon is currently seen in the Alexander Corda picture, Lydia. George Brent is currently appearing in the Warner Brothers picture, In This Our Life. Bill Goodwin will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, Wake Island. Heard in tonight's play were Thomas Mills, Fred Mackay, Sandra Coles, Arthur Q. Bryan, Francis X. Bushman, Boyd Davis, Janet Waldo, Charles Seal, Verna Felton, Tyler McVeigh, and James Eagles. 
Tune in next Monday night to hear Don Amici and Loretta Young in Bedtime Story. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System.